over all his works and guess what you are part of his works so all your works which is you and I will praise you O Lord and your saints shall bless you amen so this morning Lord we come to you to praise your great name to sing of your greatness and our love for you we know you are devoted to us but we want to be a people who are devoted to you, not just in word, but in behavior and our obedience, Father. So we say, Lord, have your way. We bow at your feet and we submit ourselves to you. And we love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, and the whole house said? Amen. That's right, good job. Let's do this.
Sing praises to your name. Praises to your name. The name that's so much higher than all names. And all. Temple, 
sing it out, y'all. Yes, you.
taking me from the miry clay so that my feet upon the rock now I Jesus, we love you. You are everything to us. Your name is the name that will be uttered on every tongue on that final day. When you wrap up all history, we will bow our knees to you. And so we just, we're practicing for that day. 
Father, we pray that you would draw us close to you. We thank you for the opportunity to experience your presence. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Your greatness, unsearchable. Who can describe how magnificent you are, Lord? We love you. We love you, Lord. There you go. Um, sometimes when I'm singing, I sing the wrong words. And, um, and usually when that happens, God tells me something. And so I was singing that, you know, though the world may fall, I'll never let you go. Well, I was singing it, you'll never let me go. And it, I just felt like I needed to come tell y'all that, that even though you may think your world is falling, he's never going to let you go either. So that's all. Sing that. The worst is, I love you, I need you. Though my world may fall, you'll never let me go. I think we can do that. <laughs> Let's sing it out. I love you. I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend. I will worship you until the very end. I will worship you. I will worship you until the very end. I will worship you. I will worship you until the very end. I worship you, my Lord, till the very end. I worship you. Worship you, my Lord, until the very end. Thank you that we have the opportunity to worship you with every breath and all that we are worship you. And as an act of worship, we're going to continue to sit in your presence, Lord Jesus, and allow you to speak your word over us. And that that word would penetrate every part of our, our being, Lord Jesus. That it would be a us knowing you deeper, because you already know everything about us. But there's new mysteries and new things to learn about you every day. So thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, and your desire to sit here with us and speak to us, Lord Jesus. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. Jesus tells us to give and that it will be given to us, full measure, pressed down and running over. As we obey him, we find that every word he said is true. And it's been our privilege as a congregation for almost 50 years to give to him. And we have seen him bring people to him, seen healings, deliverances, people filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and he's extended our congregation around the world. So we invite you to pray and give your tithes and offerings, and there are a number of ways you can do that. Uh, you can do it in boxes at the back. You can do it online. You can mail it in, or you can simply find a staff member and say, here, please turn this in. And we promise you it will be turned in, prayed over, and stewarded well. So let's pray that he will multiply what we give. Father, we thank you that in a time of need worldwide, you have more than enough. Thank you that we have the privilege of giving to a place that we can trust, that your word can go forth, that people will come to know you and be saved for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1950, the government of Northern Rhodesia forced hundreds of families and villages to vacate a valley in the middle of Zambia. At that point, the country was Northern Rhodesia and it became independent in the 60s. Now, if you live on the land and you have lived on that land and your family has for generations, being required to leave is not an easy thing. And they didn't say, we'll move you and give you reparations. They said, get out. They were getting ready to build a dam. The dam took five years uh, and it transformed much of Zambia and Zimbabwe because it produces hydroelectric power. But the people who left, left with the little that they had, which was literally a few livestock and maybe a tool or two and some clothes. But they left with anger and bitterness and distress. From 1950, for decades, that anger grew. And that valley where the Kariba Dam is, is the roughest area of Zambia. 10 years ago, Noah Ministries was given some land there and invited to come because the chiefs who control the land had seen the positive changes that happened when Noah came in and started doing ministry. So they built a small orphanage and they built a guest house, but the violence continued. Two years ago, God led Mike to start doing the Mott Mott Bible School there. And uh, word had spread. There's a network in Zambia, as in most countries, it's not dependent on electronics. Somehow word just travels through the bush. So there were people hungry for God who wanted to be trained to minister. So he started having classes. In the second class, there was a lady missing, and they said, oh, well, she burned down her hut trying to kill her husband because he was an adulterer. And that's, <laughs> that, she was not successful, by the way. Oh, but she tried. Uh, at that same time, uh, some people broke out in a fight in one of the meetings, and a soccer team turned, was playing on Sunday, and they, turned, they had a brawl, and the violence just continued. But the word of God kept going forth. And the next time Mike went for a week of classes, the lady who had uh, the pyromaniac was in class. The fire of God had transformed her. And she's now one of the leaders in the church there. The soccer team no longer plays on Sunday because they want to go to church. So all the students, many of, I mean, many of them can't read or they read minimally, but they have the word of God pressed in their hearts and minds. And they're sharing it and they're praying. And God is doing miracles. And people are being healed and they're being delivered. So God is changing a legacy of hatred and bitterness into one of love and joy in a place far, far from here. And it's our privilege to sow into that ministry every month. And many of us have visited and have seen how God is just at work there in a place that we would never expect. So as Catherine comes to share about the Acts of the Apostles, it's neat to remember that we are part of that ongoing story. As we go forth, as we preach, and as we enable others, the acts of the apostles are continuing. Amen.
oren in. In my oren. Yeah. In my oren. No. <laughs> I can't see behind my back. It's green. It's green. Yeah. It's green. It's green. <laughs> Well, I'll say something. Did I, did I just come on? Yeah. I think I'm on, right? Yeah. I'm going to say something I bet you can hear whether I'm on or not. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else say thank you, Jesus? No, and I mean it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Am I on? I think I am on, yes. But I mean it. Thank you, Jesus. Because I was up here four weeks ago, and I couldn't see worth a lick. My husband read the scripture for us. And I had my sermon written out in 20-point bold font, and I could just maybe see it. Today, I'm down to 14. 14 font. My eyes are getting better. My eyes are getting better. And I mean, but I mean it with all my heart. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I want to submit to you that every morning, we have an invitation to join the Lord in his work. But every morning, I don't know if your phone is like my phone. When I wake up in the morning, my phone already has headlines and notices and things like that that I can look at. <clears throat> and I, I, yesterday, I just took screenshots of my headlines. Um, these are the headlines that greeted me on the phone, if I chose to look at those. The science behind narcissism. Is Luna 25 alive? Russia says an emergency situation has occurred. Oh my gosh, we're going to have to check on that one. Farmer's Almanac for winter is brr, there's more snow, cold temperatures across the U.S. And then this one, signs that your cat is mad at you according to an animal behaviorist. <laughs> Doctor raises teen whose parents died after seeing former patient's Facebook post meant to be. I mean, I'm not making this up. This was the screenshots of my phone. 16 shocking red flags from marriage counselors and couple therapists that prove some relationships aren't meant to be. Thousands scramble to evacuate Canada's territory as fires blanket the regions. I didn't even know there were fires in Canada. Um, a this Is Us actor died at an early age. And the last um, set of pictures was state of emergency declared as Hurricane Hillary bears down on California. And then the Maui wildfire death toll is already the highest in modern U.S. history. Every morning we have an opportunity, if you have technology, to pick that up or we can pick up God's word and begin our day. Yes. That is, that, that, that's overwhelming, that creates fear, that brings up things that you have no control over, like it, it distracts you, but God's word grounds us. So even though I truly did say thank you, Jesus, for being able to see today, what we fix our eyes on is absolutely critical. Always has been, always will be, but right now it is a matter of life and death for us, what we fix our eyes on. So with that said, we're going to read God's Word. We're in Acts chapter 9, and I'm going to pray before we read the Word. Father, we thank you for your Word, God. Thank you for your written Word. Thank you for your spoken Word, that when we open up your Word, your Holy Spirit speaks to each one of us. And if there's 200 people in here today, that you are speaking 200 clear, specific, specific mes messages to each one of us, if we're willing to hear. We all have ears. God, give us ears that hear you today. Not me, but hear you. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you for your presence, and I thank you for your spirit, and I thank you for Jesus Christ, who has given us new life in Christ. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm backtracking a little bit. Um, I know your bookmark might have said something else, but we're going to start at Acts chapter 9, verses 19b. <gasps> wow. I knew I shouldn't have done that. Doing it um, 
digitally, but I can make it big. So this is what the Word of God says. And he was certain days with the disciples that were at Damascus. Oh, it just changed translations. We just, hold on a second. Technology, NIV. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. There we are. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, remember after many days, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and they sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. So I want to just, Pastor Scott a couple weeks ago gave a beautiful message on Saul. Just want to look at a couple of things about Saul before we move on. After his conversion, after his encounter with Jesus, he at once began to proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God in the synagogues, freely, confidently, and boldly, without apologies. And this set the stage for the pattern of his life, that he was going to be a bold proclaimer of the, of, of the gospel message, but it was going to be met with opposition from this day forward to the end of his life. And I told you to remember after many days when it says that he was in Damascus and he preached the gospel, and then it says, and after many days, that is actually most likely three years. That's important because if you just don't, if you don't know that, you think Paul had an encounter with Jesus, preached the gospel boldly, preached the gospel boldly, went off on his missionary journey. But there was actually three years that he possibly spent in the desert of Arabia alone with the Lord, getting, re, getting acquainted, not reacquainted, getting acquainted with the Lord Jesus, his call, his plans, his purposes, his mission. There are times that we have got to get alone and be trained by God and his Holy Spirit alone. Alone. Time to learn and grow and prepare. But one of the things that Saul did right away was that he saw that it was important that he was with the believers in Damascus. He wanted to be with the believers in Jerusalem. But his reputation preceded him. <laughs> they knew who he was and they knew what he, was up, what he had been up to. And they were suspicious. Was he an imposter working its way in? Can't you hear it now? A conspiracy theory. Paul pretends to be a believer so he can worm his way into the believers and then he can turn them all in. There was rejection. There was fierce opposition. The Jews in both Damascus and Jerusalem conspired to kill him. They convinced the Roman authorities, because that was a really big deal. The Roman authorities just wanted the Jewish people to just be peaceful. And they wanted to convince the Roman authorities that Paul was a problem and a disturbance and a traitor. He was a traitor to their cause. But yet, as Paul preached and he grew bolder and stronger, he was, he was sharper than they were. And they were, though, not convicted by just Paul's sharpness, but by the power of the gospel, gospel message. When we hear the gospel message, it convicts us. 
It speaks to us. But in both Damascus and Jerusalem, we see that God provides someone to come alongside Paul, Saul, to come alongside Saul and to help him find his place within the fellowship and the support of the other believers. So much so that he has disciples and he has people that are going to help him escape when people are literally trying to kill him in both places. I think it's interesting to note Saul's desire and his struggle to connect with other believers. He saw the believers, we know from the very beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that they devoted themselves to prayer, to fellowship, to worship, to being with each other. And Paul wanted to be a part of that. But we see in his writings later on, Paul's responsible for two-thirds of the New Testament. We see in his writings later on that the Word of God is telling us today that the key is connection to other believers to live out a full, abundant life in Christ. Paul says it, that we not give up meeting together, but we meet together and we encourage one another that we are mutually encouraged by each other through our faith. Saul's salvation experience changed him from a hate-filled Pharisee to a spirit-filled follower of Christ. Ha! It reversed his whole life's purposes. Instead of persecuting others, he became the hunted. He experienced firsthand the deliverance of God when he was faced with persecution and death, saw the miraculous provision of God. He had a passion and a perseverance and a loyalty to Jesus and his mission like no other. He could not keep quiet. And in some ways, Paul was unstoppable. This is a spoiler alert, but I loved, I mean, not loved that he got stoned, but there was a place that you'll see coming up where Paul is literally stoned and outside of the city left as dead and he gets back up and he goes back he doesn't get back up and run away he gets back up and goes back into the city but what I want to say is this same invitation for transformation is open to you to me today if you're here today and you are longing for life for hope, for purpose. If I could sing, I'd say, let me tell you about my Jesus. <laughs> but they don't ask me to be on the worship team. <laughs> but Jesus offers us new life in Christ. He offers us transformation where we too can go from a hate-filled person to a spirit-filled Christian. So that's Saul. Then we see Barnabas coming on the scene, and he befriended Paul. And Paul, and excuse me, Saul, it's, it's confusing because Saul is his Hebrew name, Paul is his Greek name. So he's Saul, still going by Saul right now. Barnabas befriended Saul, and he took him into the apostles' presence, and he testified to his encounter and his conversion, that he had met the Lord, that the Lord had spoke to him, and that he was preaching Jesus is the Son of God fearlessly. Saul needed to see the apostles. He needed to be accepted and embraced by the apostles. I want to say this. God is the one who anoints and calls. We don't manufacture or buy a call of God. And we also don't want to get in the way of the call of God. I think about Gamaliel, who was the, um, as, Paul, as Saul was a Pharisee of all Pharisees, he studied under Gamaliel. And Gamaliel said when the apostles were preaching in the name of Jesus and the authorities had him in and said, you got to stop preaching in that name. And Gamaliel said, hey, look, you can just let it be. If it's not of God, it'll fizzle out. But if it is of God... You don't want to touch it. You don't want to come kick against God. Come against God. With Barnabas and Saul, it began with a simple friendship. 
And I want to say that there are probably in today's world, there are many Sauls and Pauls who need Barnabases and Ananiases to come alongside of them and encourage them and welcome them. To see, to say to someone, I see this in you. To see what God sees in them and to tell them and to tell them what you see and to speak life and to put courage, encourage, put courage in someone. You know, it's more than asking around here, we ask you to sign up for a small group, sign up to be on a team. But maybe what we should say is, God, show us who we can invite, who we hold your invitation to, God, to join us. Instead of asking someone to sign up, we do the inviting. No one is beyond God's transforming power. So let's share what God has done for us and what God can do for them. So as we step away from Barnabas, I just want to throw this out for reflection. Who do you encourage in their life with Christ? Who do you encourage? And then who encourages you? You need both. So now we're at verse 31, and so if we can put verse 31 up. I know for at least the last six, eight weeks, God has been speaking to me about this verse, and I actually thought Pastor Scott was preaching on it two weeks ago, and I went over to him, I was like, the Lord's really speaking about this verse. <laughs> and he didn't go over, and he was like, so now you get to speak on it. Okay. <laughs> So here goes. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. The church enjoyed a time of peace and rest and was strengthened and built up in wisdom and faith, living and walking in the fear of the Lord and encouraged and comforted by the Holy Spirit, growing in numbers. I want to say, though, I was looking at what the political climate was at this time and what things were going on. And just real quickly, I made up these headlines that you could, th that you could see for this time period. Roman Emperor Caligula set up an image of himself in the temple in Jerusalem. The Roman Emperor has had a, is, has had a nervous breakdown, and he is not mentally sound. The Roman emperor is rumored to naming his horse as a Roman council. Saul of Tarsus, conversion or conspiracy? People of the way continue to face persecution regardless of Saul. And you know what? They can hear the words of Jesus. I told you these things so that in me you would have peace because in this world you're going to have trouble. Take heart, I have overcome the world. You can do it. But now Saul was on their team. And that in itself did bring a time of peace and rest. At least he's on our side. But the political event, events of Caligula actually setting up a image of himself in the temple definitely distracted the Jews from looking at the Christians, at the, at the people of the way. And so there was a break in the momentum of the persecution, and it was some time for some peace and rest. And I don't know about you, but what do you do when you have a time of peace and rest? This, for the, for the apostles, for the believers, this was not a time of kicking back or of revelry, but it was go time. It was time to double down on mission, Word, worship. And I can hear the words. The Bible says, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Make the most of every opportunity. Teach us, Lord, to number our days. Make every day count. And they increased all the more in strength. They were being built up in their faith. They were sharing in the teachings of Jesus. They were learning more about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, increasing in their boldness, increasing in their witness. And I want to say this. There is a divine supernatural strengthening as we do life together. 
as we intentionally do life together, God Almighty, Holy Spirit gives us a divine strength that other people are going, how you getting that? And it's just from being together because we have Jesus within us, the Holy Spirit within us, and we are strengthened. It's not something that you can manufacture. It's not something that you can get anywhere else. It is a work of God that God does alone. And Paul knew that we needed to be together. And the, the, the believers took advantage of this time of peace and rest. The church enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. What does it mean to live in the fear of the Lord? What does it mean to live in the fear of the Lord? It is a life that is marked. I wrote down a few things. We could study this for decades, but let's talk about some things for us today. Life marked by reverence and awe for the Lord and who he is and what he's done. Confident of who he is and who we are in him. Living a life that witnesses to the glory, the power, the authority, and the awe of God. Our life has power. Our life has power and is a witness to the Lord when we live in the fear of the Lord. It's wanting to know him more. I heard a sister tell a testimony about that there was a season in her life where she lost 20 pounds, not because she was trying to lose weight, but she was so in awe and hungry for the things of God. She just didn't eat. She just ate everything she could of the Lord. You can't please to, to please him and you can't get enough of him. You can please him and you can't get enough of him. Wanting to obey him. Now, we're not even willing, we people are not even willing to call the word of God the word of God. Changing the word of God. But what it's not, it's not to be afraid of him, to withdraw from him. Another way of expressing living in the fear of the Lord, we sang it today. It's worshiping him. It's responding to him with all that we have. We sang this, I worship you to live. I live to worship you. My favorite definition of what does it mean to live in fear of the Lord, maybe 25 years ago, Gosh, yeah. 25 years ago, Ruby Meekins, and if you know Matt Meekins, it's Ruby's, uh, is his mother. I was in a Bible study with her before I even knew that there was a Matt Meekins who became a good friend of mine later on. But I remember hearing Ruby with her Juan Cheese drawl talked about how much she loved the Lord, but how much she loved her daddy. And even as a young woman, as a young girl, she loved her daddy so much that even though there were things that she wanted to do, that she never, ever, ever would want to hurt her daddy's heart because she loved him that much. Loved him that much that she would never, ever want to cause pain to his heart. I think the best thing to do is to look at what the Bible says. And I don't know, we've got Joseph Hobbs back in the back doing, I know he doesn't want any accolades, but he's doing the, um, the screen today, so we're thankful for Joseph. But I'm getting ready to do a Bible drill. I'll give you these scriptures, and it's not exhaustive because there's so much the Bible says about fear of the Lord, but I'll give you, um, if anybody wants it later, I can give you what, what I reference. But we're gonna start Deuteronomy chapter 10. And now, and hear this, and now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Joshua 24, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness, Throw away the gods that your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Psalm 31, how abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you. 
that bestow that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge in you. Psalm 147. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but, a fool, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 14, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. Moses said to the people in Exodus, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. Psalm 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who follow his precepts have good understanding, and to him belongs eternal praise. Ecclesiastes, I love this. It sums it up at the very end. Now all has been heard, and here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. Listen to this one. Isaiah 8. Man, Joseph, you're awesome. Isaiah 8. Verses 12 through 13, do not call conspiracy everything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. Luke, no, Psalm 25. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. Luke 150, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. 1 Peter 1, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time here as foreigners in reverent fear. In Matthew 10, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What is living in the fear of, what is living in fear of the Lord? It is the wellspring of our life. And I don't want to dumb it down and say that it's just all about awe and respect. When John, the disciple, had an encounter, saw Jesus on the island of Patmos, he fell down as though he was dead. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I know God is God, and I know I am not. And I think it's going to be a very humbling, worshipful, I don't know. I don't think I'll be dancing in front of him. Because the Bible says we're all going to give an account. But I do know this, based on what the Bible says, fear of the Lord sounds like a smart way to live. The church enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit in increased in numbers. What does it mean now to walk in the comfort and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit? Two things were going on. They were walking in the comfort and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. We'll go to John chapter 14. Ask, and I will ask the Father, Jesus says, and he will give you another advocate, comforter, that he will remain with you forever. The spirit of truth who the world cannot receive, but you know and recognize him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. I won't leave you as orphans. You won't be comfortless and desolate and bereaved and forlorn and helpless. I'm reading out of the Amplified. I know it's NIV there, but I just wanted to say, I won't leave you as orphans, comfortless, desolate, bereaved, forlorn, and helpless. Sometimes don't you feel like that's the way we talk? Verse 26, but the comforter, and, and, this, and listen to the, these words that come from the Amplified. It's a great version to study from. But the comforter, who is our counselor, our helper, our intercessor, our advocate, our strengthener, our standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And he will call, cause you to recall 
everything that I have told you. Peace I leave with you. My own peace, Jesus says, I now give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Listen to this. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed and do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. There's so much stuff that is going on in this world today that that's the way many of us, and I'm throwing myself under that one, stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. Do not permit yourselves to be fearful, intimidated, and cowardly and unsettled because Jesus says, I give you my peace. Think about, think about this, though. So, I mean, think about what you go out and you buy these services for a counselor. Holy Spirit is your counselor. We'll remind you of everything Jesus has said, remind you of God's truth. The best counselor in the world is the Holy Spirit. He is your comforter. He comforts like no other, the divine comfort of God. He is the spirit of truth. Mm, spirit of truth in a world that we don't even know what's true and what's not. He is the spirit of truth. He's a teacher. He's going to remind us of everything. We have his peace. He is our helper. You're not alone. He is our helper. He is our intercessor. He is always praying for us. He is our advocate. He is our representative. He goes before us. We, we pay lots of money. Sorry if you're an attorney, but we pay lots of money for, to have an advocate to represent us. We have a God, we have his Holy Spirit as our advocate. He is our strengthener. And he is, will stand by us and never leave us. I'm telling you, there's so much that we have going on in this world that we look to the Holy Spirit and he has what we're looking for. And I mean, maybe what I'm talking about right now might sound all foreign to you, but let me just say this. The invitation is here to have a personal relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit and know the value, the benefit, the beautiful relationship, the closeness that you can have with God's Holy Spirit. I was reading a devotion yesterday, it just happened to be the devotion that came to my inbox from Seedbed, and the title of it was, I want the Holy Spirit. This woman and her husband were reading about the Holy Spirit and he felt that they all had a relationship. She said, he said, my wife just lifted her hand and said, I want the Holy Spirit. I want, I want you. Don't you love it when your kids raise their hands to you when they were little? I want you, I want you. Holy Spirit gives us boldness gives us a supernatural confidence that only the Holy Spirit can give. It's not your personality type and it's not your disposition. It is a boldness, supernatural boldness from the Lord. Holy Spirit gives you boldness and that boldness carries weight and it carries authority. And when you, when you walk in that boldness, you walk in the supernatural power, wisdom, knowledge, and courage of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit allows us to hear the voice of God. We come to know Holy Spirit as a person, and we come to know God's voice, and that is the only voice that we need to hear in a world where we hear so many voices. We need to hear his voice, and he wants to speak with us more than we can even comprehend. And we think maybe, you know, five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening. He wants to speak with us all the time. He wants to be your life, not part of your life. When you listen to the Holy Spirit and you trust him and you go out on a limb, huh, that's where the miracles happen. When you hear what God says to do and you just go, okay, I don't know, and that's when he's like, yeah, that's when the miracles happen. That's when you hear the secrets of heaven and God does miraculous things. You get his wisdom. You get his advice. He gives you keys that can open up opportunities that you could never have. He gives you appointments. He gives you dreams with ideas and solutions and plans. I had God give me last week in a dream a Wordle. Who plays Wordle? I saw it, I saw it as clear as anything. 
And then later I was like, man, I dreamed about Word Alliance doing that too much. <laughs> but, but then I, I heard the Lord say, look it up. And that's just for me to know, but look it up. And it was a word. God wants to prosper you. Prosper you, um, like, I don't know, I, I think this is, I, I'm sure this is right, but I just remember a long time learning about prosper that God wants to push you forward. He wants to push you forward. Like, he wants prosper. Sometimes we think, yes, you can drop all this money in my lap. He wants to push you forward. He wants to do supernatural maneuvers when the world is crying, the sky is falling. He wants to take his children, and while the world's going, it's all just said that, he wants us to be going, and thank you, Jesus, God is good, right? We're building a building, because God's building a building. He shows us how to endure, how to have strength and perseverance and patience and hope and joy and peace, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But one of the things that those disciples that were living in that, in, when I, in that description of living in the fear of the Lord and the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that they were doing is their eyes were fixed. Psalm 16 says, I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Hebrews 12 since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run our race with perseverance, the race that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What Jesus did for us allows us to run our race Colossians, set your mind on things above, not earthly things. Philippians 3.14. This is, I'm in the last season of my life. Third season, last third of my life. I, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. We don't even know that. I press, but here's what, until, until I go home, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I may not be here next week. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about what we think about sometimes. Does it fit that true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy? But then it says the peace of God will be with you. Say to yourself, I belong to Jesus. He has redeemed me, and he has called me by name, and he has said, you are mine. That can't be taken away from us. Um, the lesson I learned on my eyesight journey, well, I learned a lot, but I, as my eyes were, without going into the whole thing, my eyes were changing in vision, and so I was I, was pull I had a bag of glasses, and I was pulling out glasses from 1999 and putting them on and seeing, it. will they work? Will they work? And I'm going to tell you what, now that I do have a pair of lenses to hold me over right now for until my eyes completely heal, I was putting on my sunglasses, because I have major prescription, I put on my sunglasses to see, and it was the changing of the lenses so often that was doing me more disservice than it was service. And that's when I was like, oh, that's the way we are. We like put on our Christian lens and we're going to walk with Christ for a little bit. And then we're going to put on another lens and we're going to go do this. And then we put on our Christian lens because we're coming to church. Fear of the Lord is you don't ever take that Christian lens off. That's the way you live and move and have your being. You're going to get yourself disoriented and confused when our eyes are not fixed on Christ. Well, the last thing with being encouraged by the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit will remind us of what's to come. The, Holy, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, I know, he deserves, there we go, gosh, he's good. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what, to, what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we live, we are at home in the body, that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith and not by sight. 
We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. The Holy Spirit is a deposit and a down payment for what's ahead. It's just a portion of the full thing. Look at what we've been talking about this morning. How much is the Holy Spirit for us now? Imagine what God has for us in our eternal home. But we have assurance that we have an eternal home with him. And we should have that assurance. And if you don't have that assurance of what eternity looks like and feels like for you, then that is available to you today as an invitation to come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and allow him to put his spirit within you that will give you that assurance. So the final part of that verse was that the church was growing and multiplying. The church was living in the fear of the Lord, not the fear of man. The fear of man is a trap. The fear of the Lord is safety. I want to say that the fear factor in this world right now is terrorizing us. The fear of man and the fear itself of all kinds of things. Living in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit is greater than any encouragement that the world can give us. But yet sometimes that's what we're looking for is encouragement from the world. We're looking for it in all the wrong places. We need to be deeply rooted in Christ, not shallow roots, but deep roots. We need to be eternally minded, thinking more about the eternal part of our lives than putting so much into this part right here. The disciples were not afraid of dying. They went from running, leaving Jesus alone on the cross by himself, to now they were willing to die. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, Rhoda, we were talking about that this morning. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They triumphed over him, that's the enemy, and the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. The blood of the lamb, are you in the blood? Are you, are you, that's an old, old timey one. Are you in the blood of Jesus? Are you covered with the blood of Jesus? Are you saved? And have you shared your testimony? Have you told the world what Jesus has done for you? Remember, there's no one that's too far gone. And they did not shrink from death. Last week, my husband and I were at Dare Challenge. We do a Bible study there. Got back into the rhythm of doing that. And um, we were studying in Timothy that day. And... I challenge the guys to take this part of Timothy. I'm like, okay, so if you read that for today and you were to write on your bathroom mirror like three words to sum this up for you to remember each day before you leave, what would you write on your bathroom mirror? And we were looking at the part about work hard, show yourself to be approved, um, don't get involved in, in godless chatter, and they were all naming those things about work hard and so forth. And one of the guys threw out, Today is the last day. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, I would write up there, today is the last day, so that I didn't waste it. And you know, we don't know. We don't know. And that made me think about a couple weeks ago, we had a death in our family that was, um, no one saw it coming. My daughter's mother-in-law, So Madison married my daughter Mallory and his mom on Wednesday morning two weeks ago had a brain aneurysm. And Thursday night, she passed away. Never regained consciousness after she had had the brain aneurysm Thursday, Wednesday morning while drinking her coffee. Um, And of course that was traumatic and tragic and Glenn and I immediately drove out to Inglehard to get our grandkids, our three-year-old grandson and our six months old granddaughter and to stay there and take care of the kids so they could be with the family and be in Greenville at the hospital. 
But the question that everybody had was, what about Baylor? And Baylor is my three-year-old grandchild. What about Baylor? How is he going to handle this? Mammy is what he, Mammy is what he called Phyllis, and he was so close to her. They were so, so very, very close. And he loved her so much, she kept him a lot. Phyllis was the anchor in the hub of that family. But everybody would know, what do we do about Baylor? A friend of mine is a pastor, he went to the hospital and he said that was what the family is asking. Even though they're sitting with Phyllis as they have pulled off all life support, they're going, what about Baylor? What about Baylor? Well, you know, I've shared with you, if you've been here, that, I, that my daughter and my, son, my son-in-law raise him to know Jesus. I do everything I can to talk to him about Jesus. I didn't have to do anything. The Lord took care of it all. Thursday night, she's the, the, and he only knew Mamay was in the hospital. We rode by Outer Banks Hospital, and he was like, Mamay's in the hospital. That's where I was born. And we, we didn't talk about anything. We didn't talk about that. We talked about everything but. Um, and we were, he and I were eating watermelon. Glenn was at Sportsman's Fellowship. Cora was already to bed. And he and I were sitting in the kitchen eating watermelon. And he calls me Cat. He's like, Cat, where does Jesus live? I'm like, he lives in heaven. Where's heaven? And let me tell you what. What unfolded? I'm like, I don't know where heaven is, but I can tell you what heaven's like. And so we talked about what heaven is like that it's the presence of Jesus, there's no tears, there's no sickness, there's no death, there's no crying, there's eternity with Jesus. And he was like, oh. So the next day when we took him to her house and she's not there, the family is torn up about what's Baylor gonna do. And Madison scooped him up when he wanted to know where Mamay was. He said, she's in heaven with Jesus. And he cried. He said, okay. And he was good with that. And then he went and he sat on the floor with all the other kids. And they were playing. And the family's all sitting around. And all of a sudden he goes, Mammy's with Jesus. <laughs> She's in, with Jesus in heaven. And then he looked at other people in the room. He goes, are you going to heaven? And I'm like, I did not tell him to say that. I did not. <laughs> I promise. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't tell him to say anything like that. But who do you think did? Yeah. My little evangelist. <laughs> we were riding bikes last Saturday. We were riding bikes last Saturday. He's on the back, by, back of the car carrier, whatever, that thing on the back of my bike. So much fun to ride bikes with him. And he started telling me about Mammy's in heaven with Jesus. And so then we just started talking about what heaven's like. It's not, a, he's not afraid. He misses her, but he's not afraid. Well, if you read the rest of Acts chapter 9, because that was on your list, if you would read it, you would see that Peter is doing things that Jesus did. You see that Peter heals a man that's paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. But here's what I want to submit to you. Both of the things that happen in the rest of chapter 9, Peter heals a man that's paralyzed and he raises the woman from the dead. Peter was right there with Jesus when he did. When you read that and if you know where that is in the Gospels, you're going, wait a minute, this sounded awful familiar. This is sounding awful familiar. Peter saw Jesus encounter a man invalid for 38 years. And he said to that man, do you want to get well? Then pick up your mat and walk. Jesus encountered a man who was an invalid for eight years, and he says to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Pick up your mat and get up and walk. He saw Jesus called to a sick girl who had died. He sent the people out of the room except Peter, James, and John and the parents, and he took the little girl by the hand, and he said, Talitha Kume, little girl, get up. Peter did it too. He was called to Joppa to a home of a disciple named Tabitha who had died. So what did he do? He sent the people out. He knelt down and prayed and he said, Tabitha, get up. And she got up. 
and many believed in the Lord. This is a normal Christian life. <laughs> and he was just doing, not just doing it because Jesus saw Jesus do it. Holy Spirit reminds him of all that Jesus taught him, all that Jesus said at the right time, gave him those words. Jesus says the disciples would go out and preach everywhere and God would work with them and confirm his word in them by the signs that accompanied it. This is the normal Christian life. You know, last week when we, were taught, when we had Camp Sunday, I was just sitting there baffled, just blown away by the testimonies. So moving. But I was thinking to myself, this is an example of living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It's Camp Week, but it's, it's a call for our lifestyle. They had fellowship, community, word, worship. They heard the voice of the Lord. They were baptized. They were encouraging and strengthening and had experienced peace, and they were growing closer to each other. They weren't, some said that they first, for the first time, didn't feel alone. They felt loved. They were becoming one. I love Mike Colopy's phrase that says, it was an oasis of truth in a desert of lies. Camp week was an oasis of truth in a desert of lies. Men's community group, I see Dave Stormont sitting there. You guys had a community dinner along with the Bible study that happens in Juan Chi's Monday night a couple weeks ago. 120 men came to it. 120 men? Uh, there's a group here that is my, I call them my girls on Wednesday morning. There's a few of us we get together on Wednesday morning. One of the girls started it by just saying, hey, let's, two of the girls started it saying, let's just get together and read our Bibles. And it began just as easy as that. And there's sometimes some of us come in, we haven't had a shower, we still just rolled out of bed, or maybe we've been to the gym and we've had a shower, but we just get together and we're reading the book of John. What chapter are we on now? 15, 14? Yeah, and we just read the Bible together, and every week, there's, nobody has to make some great big lesson plan. We get together, and there are girls from other churches, body of Christ. People have asked when they've seen us in the coffee shop, we've now moved to the picnic tables, can we come? Yes, you can come. We've invited other people to join us, but it's very simple. We make it simple. We gather, we read the word, we talk about it. But every week there is evidence of the Holy Spirit speaking to us in supernatural ways. Every week. This is why we talk about liberty groups here. Do you know that serving and studying is doing life together? And that's what I said from the very beginning. Paul, Saul knew that doing life together was going to be an absolutely important, essential part of Christian living. Here at Liberty, I am excited to say that we have 30 study groups, 10 plus service groups, not including children and youth. And you know what? We have over 500 people that go to those groups. Now, there are some people that they're in every group. So they, they do like four or five things. But we have, we have so many people that are involved in fellowship group life. Um, in closing, and I'll call the worship team up. This is, an this is an invitation by the Lord to us, to you, to me, to live this kind of life. You don't need a degree. You don't need to go to a certain school or take a certain class. All you need is to have said yes to Jesus and to be obedient to the Holy Spirit and living in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. All are eligible. But you know, it boils down to trust. You have to look at what's got you weighed down. What are you afraid of? That's where you can see where your trust may be not in Christ. Do you have a marriage or a relationship that you think can't be healed? Do you have a health situation that can't be helped? Do you have finances? Do you have provision issues? Do you have sadness, anxiety, stress, time of loss or difficulty? What does the gospel say to us? Why are we so poor mouthed? We were talking about that the other day on, at Bible study. And one of the girls said, that's when we just got to do this to, it, to our friend. Just go, stop talking. I want to ask you again, where's your trust? And I wrote this word down. 
It's good in finances sometimes to have a diversified portfolio of your finances so if one thing sinks, you don't lose it all. But I'm going to say this, a diversified portfolio of trust is going to get you in trouble every time. Our trust needs to be in Jesus. Jesus and Jesus alone. First and foremost. Not in different areas and Jesus. This is all-in kind of living. Trust in the Lord alone. Are y'all still doing the normal Christian life? Can I say it? I just said it. Robin has, leads a small group called Square Pegs. They meet on Tuesday evenings, Wednesday evenings. And they're studying Watchman Nee's book, The Normal Christian Life. You're invited. So I want to say to you as we close, what are you hearing? What are you hearing Holy Spirit say to you? If you hear the Lord, you cannot ignore him, cannot hesitate. Are you all in or are you observing from the sidelines? There's several invitations out here today and there's an invitation for transformation, just like Saul, to be a new creature in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. To give your life to Christ. There's an invitation to be really connected to the body of Christ, not just dipping here on Sunday morning occasionally, but consistently being part of the living, moving organism, the body of Christ. Are you called to be a Barnabas to someone who's waiting for you to come alongside and encourage them? Maybe you're just hearing about all that God has for us through a relationship with his spirit that is within us as believers. And you're just going, I want Holy Spirit and I want to give all of me to Holy Spirit's disposal. I give my hands, I give my eyes, I give my finances, I give my heart, I give my family, I give my home, I give my car. Have it all, Lord, have it all. Have my heart, my soul, my mind. Use me. Fill me. Send me. And God's going to do supernatural things through you. He will. It's his promise. It's his word. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what others will say. Don't be afraid of what, of what man might say. Be afraid of what God might say. Because Ruby said she just didn't want to hear her daddy say he was disappointed in her. So, Father, I thank you for your word today. May your word go out and may your word return, not return void, but may your word bring a harvest. May your word bring fruit. May your word do something in our lives that will bring us to say, I'm all in. I'm all in. I don't want a diversified portfolio of trust. I just want to put it all in with you, Lord. So I thank you for your word today, God, that the church lived in peace and was strengthened as they lived in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, and the church grew. Thank you for your word, and the altars are open for us to lay hands on each other, as the word says, and pray for each other. So if the prayer team will come forward.
to worship you. 